On Thursday the 21st of September, for the first time in their 122 year history, Brighton and Hove Albion will play European football. The club qualified for this year's Europa League after finishing sixth in the Premier League last season, their record highest finish in English football. They'll be facing AEK Athens at the Amex Stadium on Thursday at 8pm. So how did a club that was playing in the Championship just six seasons ago get here? This is the rise of Brighton and Hove Albion. If you enjoyed the video, please make sure you subscribe, it helps me out massively. Founded in 1901 as Brighton and Hove United, they took the place of a defunct club in the Southern League, Brighton and Hove Rangers. They were members of the Southern League until 1920, a time in which they won their only national honours to date, the FA Community Shield versus Aston Villa. They switched to the new third division in 1920, and 38 years later, in the 1957-58 season, they were promoted to the second division. For the next 20 years, they were bounced up and down the divisions, including down to the fourth division in the early 60s. But by 1979, they finally found their way to the first division. They would stay here until their relegation three seasons later in 1983, the last time they would play in England's top flight for 34 years. That same year, 1983, they made their first and only FA Cup final. They drew 2-2 in the first leg with Man United, but lost the replay 4-0. The majority of the 80s and 90s would see them lingering in Division 2, until relegation to Division 3 in 1996. At this point, the club was starting to struggle both on the pitch and financially. The club's directors decided to sell their ground, the Goldstone ground, to property developers. This had been their home as a club for 95 years, but they had large club debts that they needed to pay off. This is a move that didn't go down well with fans at all, including pitch invasions as protests which eventually led to points deductions. The sale of the ground eventually led to lifelong fan Dick Knight taking control of the club in 1997 after he led pressure against the club's previous directors. That same season, 1996-97, is the closest that Brighton came to falling out of the Football League. At one stage of the season, they were 13 points adrift at the bottom of the table, but they battled back and set up a final day showdown with Hereford United, the team directly below them. If Brighton won or drew the match, they would be safe. Their defender Kerry Mayo scored an own goal in the first half, but a late goal from Robbie Raynham meant that they retained their league status purely based on the number of goals scored. Hereford actually had a better goal difference, but at that that time it was actually goals scored that meant more. So in modern football, Brighton actually would have been relegated. Brighton would play in Division 3 for another four seasons. The sale of their ground meant they had to play 70 miles away at Gillingham's Priestfield ground. The 2000-2001 season was their most successful in 13 years. They were crowned champions and promoted back to Div 2. And they did it again next season, winning a second successive promotion. Just five years on from nearly losing their league status, they were just one league away from the Premier League. They would fluctuate back and forth from the Championship to Div 1 for the next 16 years. So how did Brighton get from there to here? A key person in this journey is Tony Bloom, who replaced Dick Knight as chairman in May 2009. He secured £93 million of funding for the new Farmer Stadium, a new ground for Brighton to call home. It would be the first time they had their own ground since 1997. Tony Bloom, also a lifelong fan of Brighton, is a sports better and poker player nicknamed The Lizard. His wealth has been accumulated primarily through betting on sports events, and he's won over 3.8 million through poker alone. His family has had a long time association with the club. He had bought stakes in the club himself in the early 2000s before completing his overall takeover in 2009. His uncle Ray is a director, and his grandfather Harry was chairman in the 70s. Bloom's first appointment would be Gus Poye, who would instantly lead them to promotion as champions from Division 1. He would stay at the club for two years, eventually losing the playoff semi-finals in the championship against Crystal Palace. Another key person would then join the club in 2012, CEO Paul Barber. He had held previous director roles at the FA, Spurs and the Vancouver Whitecaps. Together, Barber and Bloom set a plan in motion for year-on-year -year incremental improvement. Their strategy was to outthink their competitors through smart recruitment, opportunity for youngsters, finding low-cost, high-reward acquisitions, and always being prepared for when the bigger clubs come knocking for their players. Brighton would lose a second successive playoff semi-finals against Derby under Oscar Garcia. Brighton would have the last laugh though, because at the end of the season, Bloom would hire Derby's head of recruitment, Paul Wynn Stanley, one of the pivotal figures behind Brighton's transfer success over the last eight years. Sammy Hapia would succeed him, but he himself would only last a few months before resigning after steering Brighton into the relegation zone. Chris Hewton, who Barber had worked with previously at Spurs, would join them towards the end of the season, guide them to survival, and kick off one of the most successful periods in the club's history. Just one year on from finishing 20th in the championship, Hewton would guide Brighton to third place, missing out on automatic promotion to Middlesbrough 
Middlesbrough on goal difference. The club would lose to Sheffield Wednesday in the playoff semi-finals, the third time that had happened in four seasons. But the following season, it finally happened. Brighton finished second, winning automatic promotion to the Premier League for the first time in their history. And so for the first time in 34 years, Brighton were back in the top flight of English football. Bloom backed Houston over the summer, breaking their record transfer fee several times over to improve the squad in preparation for the Premier League. Pascal Gross, Tim Krull, Victor Giacoris, and a number of others would join the likes of Anthony Canocca, Glenn Murray, Lewis Dunk and Solly March. Brighton would survive their first season in the Premier League, finishing 16th, finishing 15th and reaching the quarterfinals of the FA Cup. It would be a much harder task the following season, but Brighton managed to survive once again, finishing 17th, just one place above the relegation zone. It was at this point that Tony Bloom was ready to make a change and bring some fresh ideas into Brighton. Enter Graham Potter, another fantastic example of Brighton's succession planning. Bloom and Barber didn't just want Brighton to survive in the Premier League, they wanted them to be a successful club. In fact, the office walls of the Amex Stadium actually display their ambitions to be a top 10 Premier League club and a top four women's Super League club. Unlike many other teams, Brighton don't just wait for a manager to be sacked or to leave to start their succession planning. They prepare for every eventuality. At the time, the club was ridiculed for moving on Houghton, a manager who had taken them from 20th in the championship to the Premier League. The media saw it as a club getting above their station, but Bloom knew that something had to change. A downward spiral had begun under Houghton, and Potter seemed worth the gamble. And if you're gonna trust someone to make a bet, it's probably gonna be one of the greatest sports bettors of all time. Potter turned out to be an inspired choice. He revitalized Swansea in the championship after their relegation from the Premier League, bringing back attractive possession-based football after years of negative play. He developed players like Ollie McBurney and Daniel James. Prior to joining Swansea, Potter took Osterton's FK from Sweden's fourth tier to the knockout stages of the Europa League, beating Arsenal 2-1 at the Emirates in the process. And as a result, Potter had two massive green ticks on his CV. He'd got two teams to play attractive football on a shoestring budget whilst improving the players they already had. So Brighton made their move for Potter, and they got busy over the summer ahead of the 1920 season, bringing in the likes of Leonardo Trossard, Adam Webster, Tariq Lamptey, and Neil Malpe. They would finish 15th. They would add to their arsenal once again the following season. Danny Welbeck, Adam Lallana, Casido, Evan Ferguson, this time all for virtually nothing. And once again, they finished 16th. Now, despite their league positions not improving under Potter, there was still a sense of progress. The football was much more attractive than it was under Hutton. They were fifth in the league for XG. They were commanding a lot more of the ball with 51% possession. And unlike other clubs battling for survival, they weren't playing negative football. They had a way to go, but Brighton had something about them. The fruits of their labour would come the following season in 21-22. Brighton secured their highest ever finish in the Premier League of 9th. More additions came that summer with the likes of Mitoma and Kukurea joining for nominal fees. This was the season it started to really come together on the pitch. Their smart recruitment was paying off with several stars emerging on the pitch. McAllister, Kukurea, Trossard, Malpe, Welbeck, long-time players at the club like Solly March, Gross, Dunk, all provided as solid a spine as ever. Their blend of international talent created an exciting, unpredictable side that were tight at the back too. Goals came from players all over the pitch. And in the summer of 2022, their incredible recruitment would start to reap its rewards in the form of huge transfer fees for their players. 25 million for Basuma to Spurs, 56 million for Kukurea to Chelsea, all reinvested into new recruits to start the cycle once again. Players like Billy Gilmore, Esther Poonan and Inciso. So how are Brighton so good at their recruitment and what is it that puts them above other clubs? Well, they have a number of important principles that they don't ever compromise on. Buy low, sell high, no no haggling, they set a price and they stick to it. No one is irreplaceable, they prepare for every eventuality and they cast the net wide searching for players all over the world. And a secret component to their transfer strategy is a company called Star Lizard owned by Bloom. It's a sports betting company that uses data and analytics to provide sports betting advice and predictions to high profile clients. It makes Bloom a ton of money and all of the data is used to identify transfer targets all over the world. So when the Premier League restarted in August 2022, Brighton was shaping up to have one of the most exciting seasons yet. And then the unexpected happened. Chelsea came in for Graham Potter. All right, unexpected for us but you should know by now, not for Brighton. Just like their player recruitment, Brighton knew that one day clubs would come knocking for Potter. And just like their players, he was free to leave, but on Brighton's terms. They received 3.1 million in compensation for Potter, who left with five of his staff. But once again, Bloom and Barber saw this coming, and they already had their eyes on replacements. One month later, Roberto De Zerbi would join from Shakhtar Tonesk on a four-year contract. For any other club, this type of upheaval would derail their season. And when De Zerbi first arrived, the turbulence was clearly felt, with Brighton losing three and drawing two of their first five. But they would go on to have their best ever season in English football, finishing sixth in the Premier League. And De Zerbi would get off the mark with a win against 
against none other than Graham Potter's Chelsea, beating them 4-1. Exciting players would emerge and have fantastic seasons. Matoma Ferguson and Asaizo all started to come through. Esther Poonam would become an even better replacement than Kukurea, who was struggling for form and appearances at Chelsea. McAllister would become one of the Premier League's best in his position, scoring 12 goals before going on to win the World Cup with Argentina in December. The fact that Brighton even had a player that was going to the World Cup to play for Argentina, let alone to go and win the whole thing, just shows you how good their recruitment is. De Zerbi would turn out to be the absolute best man to build on Potter's work. He added end product to Brighton, scoring 72 goals, 30 more than the previous season. And it all continued again this summer. Inevitably, like death and taxes, bigger clubs came knocking for their players once again. Casido and Sanchez joined Chelsea, McAllister Liverpool following on from Trossard leaving for Arsenal in January. But they received over 200 million in the process. And as usual, it's had absolutely no impact on them on the pitch. They've won four of the first five games in the Premier League this season, scoring 15 goals in the process. And they've added new recruits once again in the form of players like João Pedro and Ansu Fati, who's joined on loan from Barcelona. The season upon season improvements that Brighton have been making over the last five or six years have them perfectly primed to succeed on the European stage. In their group they face AEK Athens, Marseille and Ajax. Their second favourites after Liverpool at 14-1 to to win the whole thing and for very good reason. I wonder if Bloom will be taking a pump. Good luck to Brighton for this season in the Europa League. I look forward to seeing how they go on. Thank you so much for watching today's video. If you enjoyed this please subscribe, like, comment, all the usual and I'll catch you next time. Cheers!